Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are thrilled to be welcoming back to the show, Mr. Harry Dent. Harry is a financial expert who earned his MBA from Harvard Business School. He uses proprietary research to predict economic events all around the world. He leads an independent research firm of H.S. Dent. He has appeared all over the mainstream media, including Good Morning America, PBS, CNBC, Fox, and everywhere else. He's also featured in Barron's, Fortune Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and he is an author of many best-selling books. The Roaring 2000s, Building Wealth and the Lifestyle that You Desire in the Greatest Boom in History, which covers the opportunities coming up following the current financial crisis for all of us. Harry, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Yeah, nice to be back, Michelle. Oh, it's so thrilling to have you here. It's going to be so interesting to talk about everything that we could be experiencing after we get through what we're going through right now. Harry, we're going to start off with the fact that the coronavirus has shut down the entire world's economy. COVID-19 is the most disruptive health and financial event of our lifetime. Financially speaking, what has this taught you about the market panic and about the government and the central bank's willingness to intervene? What are your thoughts about how this is being handled? Well, you know, this virus would not be the crisis it was for the markets if the central banks around the world had not built up such a great bubble in financial assets to try to treat the downturn of the great financial recession of 2008 to 2009. And after a boom like that in the 2007, which we predicted was going to happen, obviously, you deleverage debt and you get the economy healthy, you let zombie banks go under, businesses restructure debt, businesses go under, you know, and, and, and you take the workforce and, and put them out of older industries that are dying and into new industries that are emerging. And we didn't do that. Governments just decided, oh, the downturn's too much. So they printed, started printing money like crazy. They printed 16 trillion up until recently. And now with the repo crisis first and then the virus hitting, they have printed trillions more. Their, their answer to every problem is like penicillin for a cold. We'll, we'll just We'll just blast money in the economy and cover it over and keep the economy going. It's healthy for the economy to take a pause now and then. It's healthy to restructure debts. So, so what the central banks have done in the slowest recovery in history after the 2008 crash, we've seen the greatest bubble in stocks when it's not deserved. When, when do you get a stock bubble of this magnitude when, when GDP is best growing 2% a year, and when governments, the U.S. government's running a 6% a year fiscal deficit, you know, stimulating the economy and printing a half a trillion a year on, on average, throwing into the economy. So you do all this money printing and stimulus and you get 2% growth. What it tells me, what I've learned, Michelle, is simply, our economy is way weaker than we think it is. And what this virus is going to do is exposed how weak we are. We had the Asian flu a thousand times worse, killed 50 million people when we had less than a fifth as many people in the world back in 1918. You know how much the stock market went down? 11%. We were in the end of World War I. Stocks were not overvalued. We weren't in a bubble. People weren't all, you know, uh, you know hunky-dory about the world. Stocks only went down 11% because these things kill, I hate to say it, older people. And that doesn't really affect the demographics down the road as much. So this virus needs to be seen as a trigger for the biggest bubble in history. I've been warning in, in recent years, my, my last book was zero hour. And I'm saying, look, this printing money and keeping the stock market going and pumping up the economy is about to come to an end. All we need is a trigger. I'm thinking, you know, default of a major construction firm or development firm in, in China or, or a third world country blows up to follow Venezuela or the oil, the frackers in the U.S. start to default because oil prices dip so low. Well, it ended up being the virus because it's the perfect trigger. Because you know what's good about the virus from this point of view? Money print, printing doesn't do a thing to stop it. It may cushion the economy and the effects we're getting. So what I say, Michelle, is 
we're in, and this has never happened before, and that's what makes the virus a unique trigger. We're in a sudden depression, not a recession. All of a sudden, 20 million, 30 million people are unemployed by two different estimates right now. And, and we're going to have a big vacuum in demand for at least three months. And we're going to be like in a sudden depression. And, and that's going to bring prices down. It's going to freeze the economy. And what, what I think we're going to see, of course, the virus is temporary. And I was the first to predict it was already decelerating back in late March when everybody thought it was out of control. I said, no, if you look internally, the daily death rates, even though the total deaths are going straight up, they're already decelerating, which means we're this, you know, this is not going to get worse. It's going to get better. So that's why the markets have recovered. But I'm telling you, we do not come out of this shock. The demographics are, are continue to be weak after 2007 around the developed world. Debt is higher than ever because of all this free money. Now the emerging countries have borrowed another $70 trillion on top of our big developed country debt bubble into 2007 eight. All the problems we have in the Great Recession are going to come back stronger because the economy is not going to come. It's going to come out of this a little bit later this year. And by early next year, we're going to realize, no, we're in a scenario more like 1929 to 32. And what 2008 to 9 was looking like, it was looking like the Great Depression. It wasn't just a deep recession. It was, and it wasn't just financial uh, institutions failing, you know, like Lehman Brothers and stuff. It was General Motors and AIG. This was looking like the Depression. And that's why central banks just went crazy and just printed infinite amounts of money. Well, you don't get out of a problem by magic. I'm sorry. I, I'm old fashioned, I guess, in that way. You don't just print money and cover over something. Real people, real businesses, real governments in the past restructure debt, you know, let banks go under, let banks remerge, let the economy get healthy again, and then you grow. We came screaming out of the Great Depression, the 1932 low in stocks and, and all that sort of stuff. So I see this as, as we're about to enter a bigger downturn that we would have had in 2008-9 if they'd have let it keep going. And, and this is going to be a big shock. And then, and then we go into the next global boom, which will be, and I've said this from the beginning, from 2023 into 2036 to 7. That's when my demographic indicators turn positive again after turning negative um, in 2008. And they're still negative. They're, they're at a, my demographic indicators for spending in the developed world, Europe, U.S., uh, East Asia and even China in this case are all weaker into 2023 and then they turn up and then we come out of this. Right now, we wouldn't even be here if they hadn't printed $20 trillion of funny money to pump up the stock market, which at least makes the top 1% to 20% of people feel better and spend more money. Well, that 20%, that upper kind of college educated crust, that's 50% of consumer spending. So that's what's kept our economy going at 2%. You got half the spending coming from richer people who are spending more than ever. The other half's coming from everyday people that didn't get any help from the great asset bubble in stocks because they don't have stocks right. or much. It's an interesting point, too, because we've been here before in history where the banks are failing, the banks yeah. go to the government, asked to be bailed out, and the government says no and lets them fall. We, it's nothing new, it's nothing different, it's no reason, but this time, it just seems, you know, 2008 and then again, at right now, it's just insane the way the printing is happening. It's just- It, it is insane, I mean, I tell you, just before this crash, um, you had the, the repo, as soon as the Fed even just tapered off of its big, bond buying and, and money printing. Just taper it off in 2018. We go on this repo crisis where there wasn't enough liquidity to support overbank lending to cover leveraged investments in the financial industry. So the banks couldn't cover it and the Fed had to step in. They, they didn't just step in, they stepped in with $780 billion in a matter of months. So that was the first panic, says something's wrong. And then the virus hit. And once the virus hit, they promised within three days, they promised um, they would uh, $5 trillion credit line, repo credit line for banks to take any money they need to get through their crisis. They, they uh, said, we'll print another seven to 800 billion in the next few months. 
And then a few days later, they said unlimited money printing. The biggest surge in stimulus ever, guess what? On that Monday morning, uh, Monday the next day after that three days of the biggest stimulus, the stock market went down 15%. The markets finally said, look, you guys have been printing money forever. Now you're doing it even more. This is looking more desperate than real. It was when the virus slowed down in early April, which I predicted would happen two weeks before, just by looking at S-curves accelerations and decelerations. That's when the market went up. Now the market's acting like this is going to be a V-shaped recovery. There is no chance. You have a, a, a lot of the people, the 30 million that just signed up for jobless claims, analysis is showing they're aging boomers who are about to retire anyway. You know what they're doing? They're going to go on the dole and get as much easy unemployment claims as they can until they retire. They're not coming back. A lot of businesses, I don't care how much aid you get them. I went through the hurricane in Puerto Rico. We were KO'd, knocked out for three months after Maria, okay? Um, and, and then when we came back, it was a U-shaped, a slow recovery. This is the same thing. The economy is just going to be knocked out here for a few months, 20% or more unemployment. Everything's going to freeze over. And then people think suddenly business. I can tell you what happened in Puerto Rico. 20% of the businesses here, small businesses, never came back. That's what happened. They were already weak. The downturn, the hurricane exposed it. In this case, this shock is going to expose how weak an economy is that's been taking massive stimulus just to grow at 2%, which is already a big clue to anybody with their eyes open, which does not include any mainstream economists or hardly any mainstream politicians, or even Warren Buffett, for crying out loud, doesn't see this. This is ridiculous, Michelle. People are looking at me like I'm a crazy guy saying we're going to have something like the Great Depression ahead. You look at history, there's almost no other conclusion. Oh, and by the way, I look at cycles. I've been saying for 20 years that we would see a top in momentum by 2007 in demographics, and we would see a long slowdown that would not bottom until late 2022 for stocks, 2023 for the economy. I have three big cycles, particularly a 90-year super bubble cycle pointing to a top in this time frame, and we don't come out of it till late 2022. All three cycles point to that. I'm telling people, just when everybody's thinking, well, here's another big bump, but, a, but governments will print enough money and send everybody checks. There's no printing your way out of this. One. Uh, these checks will be saved by people or spent to offset reduced income. No business, even in the recovery, has been investing in new capacity. They've been using money to buy back their own stocks and leverage their earnings per share and make it look like they're growing when they're not. They're not investing in the future because they overinvested. This is an over, a classic 1929 overcapacity, bubbles in stocks and real estate, and we need a big deflation, deleveraging debt, deflating bubbles to get healthy again, and it will be unbelievably painful. It's like a heroin addict finally realizing they got a problem going into detox. It's either detox or die at this point. So I'm just warning people, I hate to say it, do not listen to Warren Buffett even, do not listen to any politician. Do not listen to financial advisors because they're all going to tell you this is just another bump in the road and we'll be at new highs next year. I will give a, a personal guarantee backed up by I will move to Australia and be a limo driver on the Gold Coast if we do not see a major crash and a major downturn by late 2022. And I think 2021 is going to be the worst year of this. We're going to come out of this like we, the 29 crash had a crash just like this, down 40-some percent right off the bat. Five-month recovery, and then it rolls right, right back over. And then two years of deleveraging, depression, deflation, the worst economy in U.S. history. That's what I see coming. I'm not a bearish person. I've been bullish most of my life. I was the most bullish economist. How do you get a book called The Roaring 2000s and The Great Boom I Had in the 90s? The most bullish. I was the only person that saw how big this boom would be because I saw how big the baby boom was coming out of the economy. Economists are looking at government policies on a bunch of baloney. I look at people who drive 80% of GDP, 70% with their consumer spending, and the 10% that businesses have to add capacity to keep up with them. That's what drives our economy, not a bunch of government laggard spending policies that always come in reaction. Government is not the leading edge, and they're doing the wrong thing here. We would have been over this crisis in 2010 
if they had not pumped their way out of it without dealing with any of the problems. And by the way, who's been doing this longer than us? Can you think of a country that's been in a coma economy for 30 years now? Call it Japan. They've used the same endless money printing. They never restructured debt. They never let their businesses and banks restructure and get lean and mean again. 30 years later, they've never come out of winter to spring. 30 years later, and we're doing the same thing. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's what I say. We're going to get our you-know-what's kick in this downturn. And I'm telling you, it's going to happen late this year, next year. I'm telling people, if you missed the first crash, which I warned about late last year, uh, don't worry. We're in this rebound, and stocks may go higher yet, but not a lot higher, and you can get out. And you better get out of real estate now because that's hard to sell. But, but I'm telling you, before, just before this election or just after, this thing's going back down. And it's, it's going to be unforgiving next time. You don't learn the lesson this time and do what, what the right thing, which is to get into highest quality bonds. Like, tre you know, the, the stocks went down 35 to 40% here. The treasury bonds went up in that same five weeks, 24%. Gold went up a little and then went down 8%. Gold is not the hedge here, better than most things. High quality bonds, junk bonds will get killed. Even AAA corporates, when a cruise line or an airline or a hotel company sees their revenues go down 80%, a AAA rating is meaningless. You're a junk bond overnight. So even high quality corporate bonds did not hold up. That's what you do. You get safe, you get out of stocks, you get out of risky real estate, high priced real estate and you wait for the downturn and rebuy like good old Joseph Kennedy did. He went from being a multimillionaire bootlegger, by the way, in the roaring 20s to a billionaire political dynasty in the U.S., largely because he got out at the top of a bubble like this and back in when stocks were down. Now listen to this, 89%. That's how much the Dow blue chip, not small caps, blue chip stocks like General Motors, RCA, Ford, and AT&T went down 89% in less than three years. That's more what I'm looking at. That's what so, you see coming. I'm just saying, if you want to be safe sometime in your life, this is the time to wake up and, and ask yourself, does it make sense that this economy would grow so weakly with so much stimulus? And does it make sense that every time we have a problem, governments just print money out of thin air and think they're going to cure it by magic? If that makes sense to you, then I hate to say it, you deserve to get kicked in this downturn. Because that's just stupid to believe that. that, that you can solve all these economic problems by printing money out of thin air and doing nothing else constructive. At least they're sending some of the money to consumers and businesses this time. That's a better thing. Even that keeps things people from restructuring. But that's a lot better than pouring it into financial institutions and blowing up another stock and real estate bubble that has nothing to do with Main Street reality and, and, and a weak economy. Okay, right, right. I uh, just want to mention Joe Kennedy being JFK's father, who... Um, yes, Joseph Kennedy was... Yeah, that's right. He's got a brother as well. But yeah, that was his father back in the Roaring Twenties. Right, right. And it, it's, you know, an historical moment to really look at because we are definitely in sort of a mirror reflection right yeah. now. I, I keep, people keep saying, Harry, this isn't really a bubble. They got millions. I said, if this isn't a bubble... This makes the Roaring Twenties bubble. It is way more global. It's in everything. Real estate. Real estate was not in a big bubble. You couldn't borrow money to buy real estate back then. People couldn't speculate in real estate. That's why. This bubble makes that one look like nothing. Bubbles only end one way. They have to crash and come down to reality. And that is painful because money, people think, oh, money's in your bank, bank deposits and banks create money. And they do create money in a boom. Financial asset bubbles create way, way more money, and that disappears even quicker. When you get money disappearing, you get deflation in prices. Businesses can't make money in a falling price environment. Consumers don't buy anything in a falling price environment. That causes the big deleveraging and shakeout. And that, paradoxically, as in the early 30s, and even to lesser degree in the early 80s, makes us healthy again for a boom. Printing money makes you weaker and keeps you from dealing with the real problem. So I think the central banks suck. I, I think they've made, created the great, my next book's gonna be called The Greatest Financial Con of All Time. 
and it's going to be what the central banks did to deal with the greatest bubble in history instead of doing what historically has proven to be the right thing, deleverage it. And you can do that more intelligently than we did in the 30s. But they instead just took the easy way out and they just print limited amounts of money. And, and everybody, oh, what a heroic. No, this is chicken stuff. This is, this is the most cowardly thing you can do is look at a major crisis and say, we're just going to take the easy way out and print infinite amount of money if necessary. Anybody that thinks that work, I hate to say, you deserve to watch your stocks go down 80% and your real estate down 50% because that's what I'm saying is the realm of what's going to happen in the next two, two and a half years. And I, I'm simple about this. And again, I'll quit my profession because everything I've studied for 40 years now points to this particular time period being the most risky in your life. And so after that, good, I'm bullish most of the time. <laughs> You know, I know you I'll are. be bullish in 2022, 23 if we go through this shakeout. If we don't go through it and keep muddling by like Japan's done for 30 years, then we'll just stay in a coma economy forever and never have a real boom again. Never. And Japan has not had a real boom in 30 years now and never will the way, the way they're going. So you see the stock markets dropping at least 80% and real estate dropping at least 50%. So just get Yeah, out. last real estate downturn was 34%. This one, it's, it was overvalued. My, my indicators, 22% back then went down 34. Now it's overvalued 41%. I'm saying it'll go down roughly 50%. Maybe a little less, maybe a little more. High-end real estate goes down more. Do you think Omaha is going to go down? No, it never bubbled because nobody wants to live there except for Warren Buffett. Okay. The more bubbly, the best thing to look at, what were your stocks worth at the last bottom in, in, in early 2009? And it should be lower than that. What was your real estate worth at the beginning of 2000 or at best at the bottom in real estate, 2011 to 12, it'll be that or lower. I, and that's, that would tell you that right there, just to go back to the 2009 lows, stocks would have to go down uh, 75% for the top. And to go back to where I see it going, it's going to be more like 85%, but somewhere in that range. That's reality. That just gets us down to where it should have been. Because um, bubbles burst and bubbles get ridiculous. And, and people get in a bubble long enough that they, they're like somebody high on crack. They don't make a decision. They're high. They said they're watching their 65 inch TV that you just bought for $499 at Costco. It would have been $10,000 12 years ago. Their, their, their stocks are going up 20, 25% a year in their 401k. Their real estate's going up 15% when inflation, which real estate correlates with long-term, is going up 2%. They're getting a free lunch. Of course, people are high. Nobody wants to listen to somebody like me say, hey, by the way, folks, this bubble's got to end. They don't want to hear that. You bet. I'm just saying, you better hear it because bubbles only do one thing in history. And if anybody's got a bigger stock bubble than this, I want them to come show it to me. I will stand by side by side. I, I stand by and kiss, you know what, of anybody who can show me a bigger bubble than this in history and everything. It just doesn't exist. If you don't think, see this as a bubble, then you're blind because it's totally obvious. So your advice is to get out of everything right now, hold your cash, except for... I, I think now see, the stocks have seen at least most of their gains in, in this rebound historically, like in the 29 crash, first crash and first rebound. Stocks made most of their gains in the first month and then kind of went sideways. And da, 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 da. Um, This is a good time to sell stocks. I think close to the election will be the last chance. Um, Real estate, I say, work on now because it takes longer to sell real estate. Real estate requires debt to purchase, and, and debt has already been uh, restricted because of the virus. And, and so I'd say real estate you need to really work on uh, because, boy, after this election, I think you, you'll have a hard time selling real estate because the, the, the markets will just clam up like it did in 2008. So, so yeah, I, I think you got to get as safe as you can now. And if I'm even half right, you're going to be rewarded the best in your top life because the world's going to be on sale. You could have bought anything in 32, 33, any financial asset, any real estate, any stock still standing, any commodity, gold, you name it. And you would have made money hands over fist for decades to follow because you would have bought at the lowest point in modern history. And then the next lowest point was 1982. And, and, 
This, the next one's going to be 2022, 23. I can tell you that. And I've been saying that for 20 some years. It's not, I'm just saying it's not because of the virus. The virus is the perfect trigger. The virus may be over by sometime next year. It only took a, a year to, for the entire Spanish flu to run its way and kill 50 million people. One year before that was over. So it's not the virus. It's that's the trigger. This is a financial crisis that's been brewing for years, and this is something that, that will hit the economy so hard that it'll show how weak it actually is. That's the importance of the virus. It's going to show how weak. We will not be able to come out of this, and the stock markets are assuming as soon as this virus, the deaths go down later this summer, which they are projected to, now twice as much as they thought earlier, um, oh, it'll be over. No. It will not be over. That'll be the best time to sell your stocks when this virus does get down to near zero and things look okay. That's that's your final chance to sell stocks. I, w- I would I would feel good selling them right now because the markets have come up way high, and 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 I think even if they go higher later this year, they'll be they'll go lower for. I mean, they'll they'll there'll be a lot of volatility. So this is this may be close to as good as it gets, from my view. Right. So um, I was going to switch the topic to gold, but you seem to be uh, a little bit bearish right now on that. <laughs> Why don't you expect yeah, yeah, I, I am. Gold is an inflation hedge. Gold correlates, and I got this back to the 1700s or something, way back, hundreds of years. Gold correlates better with inflation than any single, even more than bonds, which correlate with inflation. Bonds hate inflation love falling inflation. So they correlate inversely with inflation. Uh, Gold correlates positively with inflation. What have we tried? We've been printing money. Gold went up in 2008, 9, 10, 11, thinking all this money printing was going to create inflation. Guess what happened? No inflation. Then it crashed to a thousand. Well, now it's rallied. I saw it was going to rally. I'm saying 1800 was my big say, man, I think 1800 is about as high as gold gets. Why again? Now it's unlimited money printing. Oh, that's even better, okay? I think gold could be peaking here, and and gold goes back down to as low at a minimum and probably a bit lower than it went in, in 2008. And gold was at its worst when Lehman Brothers broke down. Gold was not the crisis hedge that it was supposed to be. It was not because we had deflation at that point. Gold likes inflation. So gold is the wrong hedge. Gold was the right hedge for the 70s inflationary recession, which was the trends for 14 years from 68 to 82, rising inflation and increasing recessions. This is more like the 30s, deflationary, deleveraging of debt and financial asset bubbles. And in that environment, it is 30-year treasury bonds is your best safe haven. They like the fall in interest rates, but unlike corporate bonds and particularly junk bonds, they don't default, no matter what. If the government has to print money to pay, they will. They are not going to default. So the default risk doesn't kill it, and the falling further, we're going to have zero interest rates long term pretty Mm -hmm. soon. Right. Bonds are going to like that. And what, what just went up? The only thing, the U.S. dollar went up and the Treasury bonds went up. What are the gold bugs saying? Dollar's going to crash. Gold's going to go to 5000 And if the dollar crashes, then U.S. Treasury bonds are going to crash. You know what? Gold bugs are going to be as wrong about this as anybody, although I respect them more because at least they're right in telling people we're going to have a crisis because you can't borrow and print your way to prosperity. Right. You know, idiots. Duh. How obvious should that be from history? When, when was history easy? When, I mean, the, the old thing was life is hard and then you die. How about that? You know, that's closer to reality than, oh, we just print money and the economy goes up. You know, that's crazy stuff to believe. Only people high would do that. Crack addicts will sit on a roof and think they can fly off if somebody doesn't catch them. You know, that's what people are like right now, including really respectable people, like I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Really respectable okay. people saying the government's doing the right thing. Printing money to solve problems is never the right thing. Hey, 2009, I would have been sit right there saying, print that first trillion to give a liquidity sh- shot into the economy so the banking system doesn't just, you know, break down automatically out of an overreaction. 
Mm. That would have been smart. But to print a trillion a year every year after that or two trillion globally, that's insanity. That's taking more of a drug to keep from coming down off of a, a, a downer. That never works out well. So that's my view. I know people don't agree with it. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to be right about this because I've studied history and I don't, have, I don't have any vested interests here. I'm not the chief economist of Merrill Lynch. I'm not a major investment manager like Warren Buffett who doesn't want this crash to happen. Guess who's going to get his, you know what, kick in this crash? Warren. A little less because he's been lightening up. He's telling the American public he never go wrong buying U.S. great companies in the U.S. Well, he ain't buying them right now. Even in this crash, he's not buying them. So he's a little smarter, frankly. But that's interesting. That's, you know, I'm just bringing the message. Um, so I'm going to repeat one more time. Your one hedge is the 30-year Treasury bond. The biggest hedge. But from that. Cash is a good hedge because your cash preserves your value. Well, everything. Here's the thing about a, a uh, what I call the winter season or a, a deflationary downturn. Even in the inflationary 70s, commodities did well. Real estate likes uh, um, inflation. Japan was in a strong surge like China is today, you know, recently. A lot of things did well. Um, bonds got killed. Stocks got killed. In a deflationary downturn, stocks get killed. Real estate gets killed. Uh, commodities get killed. Gold gets killed. Everything gets killed except for cash and high-quality bonds. In the 30s, the AAA corporates, and only the AAA corporates, did well. In this case, they didn't even do well because of the virus, but I think that's temporary as well. So the high-quality bonds, AAA corporates, those are typically 20-year bonds, 10- and 30-year treasury bonds, some of the better bonds in the world, Australia maybe, Sweden, Germany, not Japan, not most of Europe, not Italian bonds for crying out loud, or Greek. Um, China is the worst, the epitome of this bubble. So, so you have to get in the safest stuff. And, and if you don't know what to do, just sitting in cash, cash. is not a bad idea because that cash will buy infinitely more. Cash today at a dollar and stocks buy drop 80%. Well, you can buy that many more times, five times as many stocks for the same dollar. Oh, that's how Joseph Kennedy became a billionaire instead of a multimillionaire. Learn from Jeff. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. That's what's incredible about this. I yeah. I, I see it as an opportunity. Businesses, businesses at home. General Motors had been number two to Ford for 20 years. Passed them in the downturn because they were more focused, stronger financial uh, controls, better management. Passed Ford. Ford never came, came back. Uh, never caught up with them. They became the number one car company first in the world in, in, in the 50s and the number one corporation in the entire world in the 60s, per, largely because they took advantage of the great crash and came out of it with stronger market share and position. So businesses hunker down, come out stronger, competition fails, people who get turn their bubble assets, real estate and gold here and stocks, into cash and safe bonds, and then rebuy. Gold's going to have an incredible boom. Guess who buys the most gold in the world in the next commodity bubble every 30 years? Asians, particularly Indians, even more than Chinese. They're going to be dominating the next boom. Asia, gold's going to go to three to 5,000 in the next boom. I just want to wait until it goes back down in this deflationary downturn, and then buy gold at maybe 700 to 1,000. Then I'll load up the card. Not now. That's what I was going to ask. What's the price that you're looking at? You could, you I, could I, my, bet, my best target for gold, only because it's held up already better than most commodities, it has gone down every time we have a crash, is 950 bucks around there. 950 to 1,000. Worst case, 700. I used to have 700 as my best case. I think gold, I, if we see gold, let's say in late 2022 in my cycles, it, it, let's say nine or fifty bucks. I'm going to say load up the cart. It's going to three to five thousand uh, for now over many many years. But it's going to be a bull market. Um, but I, I'd still rather probably buy uh, Indian stocks more than gold. India is going to be the next China. There's no two ways about that. It's the only large Asian country that hasn't urbanized rapidly, and it's going to do it when China falls. And China is going to fall harder than any other major country in the world. 
because they have overborrowed, overexpanded more than any country. That we were the the epicenter of the Roaring Twenties bubble. The U.S. We were the emerging China-like country back then. China is that today. China goes down the hardest, and everybody's thinking China's going to save the world. Sorry, China's What's your gonna timeline be on that, Harry. Huh? What's your timeline on that? Same thing that China goes down in, in the next couple of years. The difference is China is going to take longer to come out of it. In India, Southeast Asia, the rest of Asia will come screaming out of this the most. Africa, too, with all the strong demographics, Middle East, oil coming back. China will be the laggard coming. I don't think, I think China will take, you know, maybe 2025 or so to even start to turn around. And then they're already mostly urban and their demographics. They're the only emerging country in the world, Michelle, the only emerging country at this point that has declining demographics. Their demographic curve has already peaked while the rest of Asia is gonna go up for decades and Africa for longer than me and my grandkids are gonna live. So demographics tell you where there's gonna be boom. And, and, and China has demographics against it. And, and has the greatest debt burden compared to its economy and the greatest excess capacity. You know, they have 22% condos empty. They have the greatest real estate bubble in history and 22% of the condos built are empty. That wouldn't happen anywhere else in the world other than a controlled economy called China. So guess who's gonna crash the most? Guess how long it's gonna take to work off those empty condos? A long time. So don't even think about China for a while. China's dead. Already died. They just haven't announced the funeral yet. That's so interesting. Harry, I want to get your take on Bitcoin. Okay, that's a really interesting one. <clears throat> I'm not an expert on Bitcoin. I've, I've talked at three or four Bitcoin conferences. A lot of the Bitcoin people are coming to Puerto Rico where I'm at because of the low taxes, which really benefits them because they have a lot of short-term gains in such a volatile uh, thing they're in. Bitcoin to me is like the internet in the late 90s. It is the last concerted bubble to come in a bigger technology bubble. The last to go, it gave the last goose. And then when technology crashed in 2000, 2002, the internet bubble crashed, led that crash. It was the worst of the crash. So I see that right now. But internet at the same time on a 20 year lag is the next big thing. The fact that internet bubbled so much, I mean, I'm sorry, blockchain, and cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin bubbled so much, even more than biotech and other leading sectors, tells me it's the next big thing. It's called the hype stage. So for example, one stock, leading of the internet revolution. Amazon goes uh, public, I think at six bucks and 97, goes up to 160 something in the, in the bubble in the early 2000, crashes back down to six in, in 2001, and then goes up, now it's at 2400 you know, 15 years later or something, you know. So it was the next big thing, but it crashed hard first. I would not touch, right now this probably got a little more upside with the halving, but I think later this year, early next year at the latest, Bitcoin sees as good as it's gonna get, maybe not even that long, and then it crashes 90 some percent. I wanna see it go down over 90%, and then I'd, be, I'd say forget buying gold, it's 700 or 950, you could buy Bitcoin back at where I think it's going to go to like maybe 1300. Oh my God. Uh, that would be probably the single biggest play you can make in life. I don't want to touch it till then. Even right now, it's too volatile. I think it may go up. My, we've got one Bitcoin somebody gave me because I, I told them to get in a Bitcoin at some point and they made money. They gave me a Bitcoin as a, as a tip. We got one Bitcoin. We'll hold that. And, and tip. <laughs> I think it may go up, but I, I, I do think Bitcoin goes a lot lower, and then it's the it, it is the next big thing. It can solve all the security problems and cost problems. I mean, the internet's running out of steam here. It's hard to do business on the internet and security and stuff. Mm. So blockchain is the answer to that. I'd say a digital currency down the road is the answer to top-down money printing to control economies. I would see, like the Bitcoin people would down the road, that money gets created out of the natural transactions of business and consumers in a decentralized digital context instead of central banks trying to 
stimulate economies and abuse them and, and manipulate them from the top down. And I can't wait for that to happen. We do not need a central bank except to provide liquidity in crises. They should not be trying to affect interest rates and steering stock markets and economy. They have blown it. They were created in 1913. And guess what we had in 1929? Greatest bubble in history and then the greatest depression and crash. They stoked that. It would have happened without them, but they stoked that and made that bubble bigger and that crash bigger. We don't need these academic economists who apparently never had sex, number one, and number two, never run a business for sure. You think any of these guys, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, ever run a business? And they're running our economy? This is insanity. I'm looking forward to their disappearance. They're going to go with these bubbles they created, and nobody more deserve. Uh, How about that uh, uh, clincher? (laughs) Now, you mentioned 1300. I want to get a timeline for Bitcoin on that one for everybody. I would say the same thing like late 2022, early 2023. In other words, it's the epitome of this bubble and then the epitome of the crash. And the Internet was the epitome of the last tech bubble. It came the strongest at the end, it bubbled the most, and it crashed the most. The the tech bubble went, NASDAQ went down 78%, the internet bubble went down 90-some percent. That's when I look at, when when Bitcoin is down 90-some percent, I'd say just throw out 93 to 95, then I'd be salivating, and I'd be buying the surviving companies. And I think Bitcoin's most likely to be a survivor. Um... Ethereum is, is more in the blockchain space of helping to create blockchain companies. I think they'll be a survivor, but I'll have to wait then and decide. Amazon would have been a pretty obvious target. They were in a huge internet retail crash where Webvan and zillions of dot-com companies disappeared overnight, which they deserved to. They were nothing. Amazon was clearly one of the largest and one of the leaders. That would have been an obvious stock to buy in 2001-2002. But so I'll wait till then. But man, I, I, I'm telling you, crypto and more so blockchain is the next big thing in technology. It okay. is Internet 2.0. What it is, to make it simple, one sentence, it is the digitization of all money and financial assets. Everything of value is going to come under the blockchain thing. See, the Internet's very good at, at dealing with information which the security is not a big deal. When you start talking about money and value, that's when you get hackers and stuff and all this security problem. It takes blockchain to really make dealing in financial assets and things of value efficient and secure. Internet cannot do it. I don't even want to deal. I'm sick of dealing on the internet. I got to give six passwords and change my password every damn day. I can't do it anymore. I want to call the, get on the call Get a nice old lady somewhere in Las Vegas in a, in a call person. center. <laughs> give her my, my credit card and buy something, okay? No password. Right. You know? Now, Harry, okay, I'm going to take this one step further. So you're believing Bitcoin's going to ride the market. Market's going to fall. Bitcoin's going to fall, too. You're looking right, 1,300, maybe a little bit lower, something around there. So but- somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 would be a range. I'd see Bitcoin going, and then it's like, oh, and now. Then, it's- now, my qu- next question, are you at all in the category of Bitcoin going into the hundreds of thousands after that? It, it is possible because if – now, okay, you've got all these individual coins. I think that's mostly baloney. You don't need a coin for pets and a coin for non I mean, you know, okay. If there's going to be a standard that replaces the gold standard of the past, Bitcoin, especially with its limited supply by its own charter, would have to be worth way more. So it might have to be worth a million dollars a coin. But that's not something you're using to buy stuff. You're not going to buy something with a million dollar coin, obviously. You'd have to be a thousandth of a percent to even buy a car. It could come up and be more mainstream and get high enough value and it have to be worth many, many trillions and it's only worth billions and billions right now to maybe become both more stable and become a digital standard for money. That's a possibility. That may not be what happens with Bitcoin, but I, that's what supposedly happens. Something needs to become a standard and it's, 
It could be a bunch of coins. I don't see that happening. You need one standard for money. You need a lot of different ways of buying things and stuff. So, so yeah, Bitcoin could be worth a lot more money. I mean, even now, people say if there is, and I think there's a possibility of this, because of the halving, Bitcoin has gone up every four years on a year lag to the halving, which is right now. So late 2013, there was the first bubble and an 84% crash. Late 2017, second bubble, 84% crash. We might get a new high in Bitcoin temporarily. And then what would tell you it's really over is when you get a 90 some percent crash and that's when you buy it. That, that's the way I would look at it. Okay. I'd say the odds are Bitcoin's already put in its high and maybe it gets back to 10 or 13,000 here. You know, I, and, and I'm not willing to gamble on it. It's too volatile for me. Mm-hmm. I don't think people should be gambling on Bitcoin unless you just buy one. Like we, we have one Bitcoin. Okay. So, so that's cool. I can gamble with that. So, so it, it's an early stage industry. Early stage industries are the most volatile. I mean, the car company, there was a hundred car companies and ended up four. That's what happens from early stage into mainstream. So there's going to be more crypto and blockchain failures, just like there were internet companies, than you can count. So it's too risky for most people to be picking blockchain or crypto companies, you know? If you're going to bet on anything, just maybe bet on on, on Bitcoin because it's like the biggest thing and it's most the market anyway. But um, and, and then we'll see. I, I'd have to look at the market a couple of years from now and see what's still standing to know what to buy from. Maybe Bitcoin fails and Ethereum ends up, you know. I mean, it, it was General Motors that ended up on top. Anybody before the in the roaring 20s would have thought, well, we do have a big shakeout. It's going to be Ford. No, it ended up General Motors. So you can't tell that all the time. That's very interesting. Now, Harry, before we go, I want to take a moment to talk about your books, your advice and your insight on how to take advantage of your own financial predictions is extraordinary. And for anyone looking to strategize, please give everybody an overview of your books because you've written a fascinating, almost a little library that people oh, yeah. can. Yeah, it's probably 11 or 12 books over the last two decades, yeah. Go through them just real briefly. Well, we'll you know, real quick, there's, there's three books I would read of mine. The Great Boom Ahead to show, I mean, we saw, not, we saw the collapse of Japan before it happened, as well as the Great Boom, and that was so opposite back then. The Great Boom Ahead, my first published book, The Roaring t- uh, 2000s, which came out in, in, in 98. You mentioned that book earlier. That, that book came out a long time ago. And we said that boom, even the bust after the, the fall of that, I said that, that boom's not going to be over until 2007. And then my most recent book a few years ago was Zero Hour. And that's what I, we talked about, the geopolitical events and this polarization between blue and red and all the stuff that's happening. Um, but my next book is going to come out probably later this year, and it's going to be called The Greatest Financial Con of All Time. So look for that. Somewhere before or after the election, I, I'm targeting so on, on, on Amazon. So, so, but right now, it's always best to read the latest book. Zero Hour would be the best book to read now. But, but uh, at this point, you might do better to wait for it. For the, the next one's going to be a doozy. Uh, and, and it's going to be better time than uh, all that sort of stuff. And, and also, uh, Michelle, uh, our newsletter switched. We were published by another company, and, and, and they decided not to publish it. And we're, we're harrydent.com is where our newsletter's at. We've got a paid newsletter, HS Dent Forecast, but also a free newsletter uh, called Harry's Take at harrydent.com. You just put in your email and, and you can get to know us. I mean, you need to get on our better newsletter, certainly, but, but you can listen to us as long as you need to to decide we know what we're talking about. And I think you're going to find out we know what we're talking about. Because I can tell you what, nobody else does right now. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. You're always amazing and fun and very, very informative. (laughs) Okay. Thank you, Michelle. You got it. Mr. Harry Dent, financial expert, best-selling author, commentator, and the man behind HarryDent.com. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.